Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on August 16th, 2023. Here at First Presbyterian Church, my name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we are going to do our daily lectionary readings for today and talk about it and hopefully um, read well, read the words right. Sometimes there are words that are a challenge or there might be a hyphen in the middle of the thing and it throws us off. But nonetheless, God's word is here for us today and so we're going to engage in that and um, See what, uh, see what we might uh, discover as we look at these things together. Let me open this word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for the day, the many blessings that you have provided for us. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for speaking to us, Lord. Let us have ears to hear. Let us have hearts to understand. Um, let us uh, be transformed by this reading today. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today, we're going to start with Psalm, 80, uh, Psalm 89, the first 18 verses. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God feared in the council of the holy ones, great and awesome above all that are around him? O Lord, God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you created them. Tabor and Hermon joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord our King, to the Holy One of Israel. And from Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. All right. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew scripture reading today comes from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 14, verses 21 through 33. Then the king said to Joab, Very well, I grant this. Go, bring back the young man Absalom. Joab prostrated himself with his face to the ground and did obeisance and blessed the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord the king, and that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab set off, went to Geshur, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. The king said, Let him go to his own house. He is not to come into my presence. So Absalom went to his own house and did not come into the king's presence. Now in all Israel there was no one to be praised so much for his beauty as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head there was no blemish in him. 
When he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head, two hundred shekels by the king's weight. There were born to Absalom three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a beautiful woman. So Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without coming into the king's presence. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but Joab would not come to him. He sent a second time, but Joab would not come. Then he said to his servants, Look, Joab's field is next to mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab rose and went to Absalom at his house and said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? Absalom answered Joab, Look, I sent word to you, come here, that I may send you to the king with the question, Why have I come from Geshur? It would have been better for me there to be there still. Now let me go into the king's presence. If there is guilt in me, let him kill me. Then Joab went to the king and told him, and he summoned Absalom. So he came to the king and prostrated himself with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. And from Acts chapter 21, verses 15 through 26. After those days, we got ready. Am I in the right place yep. there? Okay. After these days, we got ready and started to go up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came along and brought us to the house of Mason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to stay. When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to visit James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they praised God. Then they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of believers there are among the Jews, and they are all zealous for the law. They have been told about you that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, and that you tell them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what, so do what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Join these men, go through the rite of purification with them, and pay for the shaving of their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself observe and guard the law. But as for the Gentiles who have become believers, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having purified himself, he entered the temple with them, making public the completion of the days of purification when the sacrifice would be made for each of them. And our gospel reading today comes from Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. 
Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. And back to our Psalms with Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in a season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And our final psalm today is Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Praise the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all humankind. From where he sits enthroned, he watches all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds, the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might it cannot save. Truly, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I certainly hope that you have been following along at home in your daily lectionary reading, because sometimes when you get into the uh, historical narrative books, there are some things that are going on that are kind of difficult to jump into in the middle of, but the uh, Second Samuel passage in this uh, verse this chapter 14 that we've been reading. Um, as we did on Friday, this is uh, following the events of David with his um, killing of Uriah and his uh, rape and impregnation of, of Bathsheba and Nathan coming and bringing God's judgment and word and even, their, even the son of Bathsheba dying. But then we see that uh, that Bathsheba bears another son to David, and that is Solomon, who it does say the Lord will love. But the, the pronouncement of judgment against David, that um, the sword would never depart from the house, and that there would be uh, dissension and division within his house for the rest of his life, basically, because he did that terrible thing to Bathsheba and to Uriah, um, is playing out. And if you have been reading along, you know that David has multiple sons from multiple wives, and one of those sons is Amnon, and one of the sons is Absalom, and, Ab and Amnon um, uh, sleeps with uh, one of David's daughters, Tamar, who happens to be the sister of Absalom, and then Absalom actually goes and kills Amnon, and so we see this 
uh, internecine battles and wars going on between David's children. And uh, at this point, though, Absalom had been kind of exiled and at least run away. Uh, David does mourn for his son. And Joab, who is uh, David's general, mm -hmm. wants to bring Absalom back into Jerusalem, but there's still this tension there. And it's this terribly strange story where here's Absalom back in the presence, well, back in any way, the, the city of David. Right. But then he sends for Joab, and Joab doesn't answer. It's like, well, go burn his field down. You're like, I'll make him talk to I'll me. Him, right? Like, and, and I know I've read these stories before, uh, but it's one of these things where I think we all probably forget some of the details. And so when we're reminded of these details, we go, really? That's in Holy Scripture? Like, how is... What are we supposed to learn from this? How does this affect us in our daily lives? And it's one of the challenges because in the Bible, there's a lot, like everything in the Bible we believe is true. Some of it is historical, some of it is poetic, some of it is prophetic, uh, but it's all true. It's all God's word. And the, the understanding that we need to make is sometimes it is descriptive of things that have happened and not proscriptive on things that we should do. So clearly this is a description of a historical right. event that's going on, but this is not proper behavior. <laughs> right. We should not be doing these things. This is a consequence of the sin that David has uh, committed and now within his family, they are experiencing the consequences for it. And so uh, just that reminder that even amongst uh, people that we would consider the heroes of faith, David being a prime example of one, the sin in his life has an impact on his family. And we read about this as, as a warning, really, as a testimony uh, against doing those things that are contrary to what God would have us to do. So it's, it's a, it seems like a random kind of one-off story, but there is that strange... Uh, description about how Absalom was so beautiful and just had so much hair and every year he would cut his hair and it was really heavy and uh, and I thought that was interesting as we read from the Acts story that Paul when he came back from doing his missionary work amongst the Gentiles there are Jews that were afraid that Paul was uh, teaching against the law of Moses and the people in Jerusalem are just like, hey, you know, take a vow, pay for these guys' haircuts, demonstrate that you're following the law of Moses. And so I, I, I just thought that was kind of an interesting connection because when right. does it ever talk about haircuts in the Bible? You know, I don't know. Well, Absalom, right? Absalom, <laughs> yeah. Paul. Well, but who was who was the other big haircut story? Samson. Samson. <laughs> Hmm. Do we see a pattern here, right? Okay. Samson, problem, haircut. <laughs> I don't know. But even what's going on in Acts is not necessarily the best thing. There are Jewish believers in Jesus mm -hmm. who are still uh, uncertain as to how Gentiles can come into the faith. Right. And there's, there's tension there. There's still this connection to the law, which right. the law has value, right. but it's still the law. It's like they feel like if they can keep the law, then that will grant them righteousness. If they can do these things and it's they miss the point, you right. know, it's, it's matters of the heart versus matters of all these little things. We can check off boxes, done that, done that, done that. And so there's still this connection, which I mean, I can understand. I mean, that's that's what they were taught. I mean, they all know the Old Testament. They all know those books of the law. And so there's this tie, and I guess it's, they're still grasping onto this. This is something we can control. Right. And I think that's the desire there to, to hang on to some of that control and, and to feel like they have some uh, I think you're some right now. power there. Right. Um, and so they don't, if you're not willing to do these things, can you really be invited? I mean, that's their question. You know, if you're not willing to do these things, can you truly be invited into 
into what Christ has done, and right. they're struggling with that. Right. Uh, and I regularly reflect upon how do we, even today, even we who are not ethnically Jewish, right. when we read things from the law and we read about expected behavior or uh, prohibitions or sacrifices and we read those things and we are kind of detached from them because we've never fully practiced all right. of the ritual that is included in uh, in the Old Testament and and the reason why we don't do that is we have Jesus himself explaining how certain things are no longer uh, uh, required and then we also have the early church wrestling with that issue on really our behalf and right. earlier in Acts chapter 15 uh, we do see where there is a, uh, a council that meets in Jerusalem and they're originally listening to Peter uh, talk about his story with Cornelius and how the Holy Spirit came upon the Roman centurion Cornelius right. and and you know if the Holy Spirit comes upon non-Jews, then clearly being a Jew is not the prerequisite for the Holy Spirit. Right. And so they're wrestling again with this concept of uh, who is in, who is out, who is clean, who is unclean, are all of the laws gone, or just some of the laws, and it, uh, Jesus was and is disruptive of the ordinary things that we are used to and so here they are back in Jerusalem and the Jerusalem council is still trying to say hey we know that the Holy Spirit's available and we we have some boundaries around you know proper behavior you know don't uh, don't eat what's been sacrificed to idols and don't eat blood and don't eat what's strangled and abstain from fornication and so they're they're putting some boundaries upon appropriate behavior right but they're not they're not binding the gentiles to the law um but yeah it's it's, it's pretty fascinating stuff actually um but again what do we do today and the same the same spirit of who's in and who's out or you know what's right and what's wrong that same spirit i think still uh, has the potential to affect the way we do a lot of things today. Uh, do right. we really truly desire to share Jesus with people or do we expect Jesus to worship exactly like we do? Do we expect Jesus, to, I mean, do we expect the, the people to, right. to, to to do that which we do or, yeah. Right. You know. And do our own, do we have our own set of standards right. Right. or set our own boundaries that really are determined by us versus anything that we find in right. here right. and um, I think we have to be careful about getting tied to our ideas because yeah. uh, we, we can make rules and laws very well but they are not here right. we can and make so, rules and laws very well but they're not here mm. so I think we just have to be careful about that Right, um, and again, it's it's not it's not that they were immune to the problem, or, or, or you know they they wrestled through it. Right. I get it, and we are still wrestling through it. This is not as if we are better than or more enlightened than. It's just you know what what do we learn and what do we practice, and that's always a complication. It's it's, it's always going to be one, and if we. If we jump back over to Matthew, I mean, sorry, to Mark chapter 10, um, it's, it's this famous story of the, the rich man who comes and he clearly, uh, you know, believes that Jesus has good words to say and he has a desire for eternal life. Um, and what does, what does Jesus share with him? You've kept the law, but... Um... Go sell everything you have, and then come follow me. Right. And um, I think that 
that goes back to that. We can keep that set of standards and those, we can keep those laws and still fall short mm. of the intent, the heart, um, you know, of, of loving Jesus. You know, this, this man is grieved because he has a lot of stuff. Like, so his stuff had more value than eternity. I mean, that's... Seems like what boils down, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, he he's he's shocked and he goes away grieving, and because he had a lot of stuff, and so it's like, I mean, it sounds so silly, but yet, how many of us would walk away from all the things? Teacher, I've kept all, all these the things laws. all since my youth. I haven't murdered anybody. That's good. Right, not a bad thing. Not not a bad thing. Yeah, what thing. else is in there? You haven't the, defrauded. Did, you haven't no, lied. Ten committed adultery. Perfect. Yeah. Honor your father and mother. Wait, okay, wait, wait. That what? one's kind of hard sometimes. <laughs> I get it. But, we love our mothers and fathers. We do. Um, but if it wasn't difficult, it wouldn't be in there, right? It's and, it's an ongoing it's thing. An ongoing if it thing. were common sense, it would not have to be written in scripture. But. But in reality, I, you know, we can, I haven't done any of those things. But do you love me? Will you give up everything for me? Right. Will you make me most important and walk away from the world, the things of the world? Um, so it's not only the young, uh, no, the, the rich man that's shocked. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus' disciples are shocked as well right. because Jesus then makes it really explicit how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples are like, um, mm, wait, okay, my understanding has always been that the rich people are blessed by right. God. That's, why, that's they, why they're rich. That's why they're rich. They have blessings. So clearly God must already love them clearly they must even already kind of be in god's kingdom you know there's this whole concept of and, and i think we do it today there's celebrity culture where we we idolize and, mm -hmm. and in some ways we kind of worship those that have so much or you know people that desire fame on you know TikTok or to be the next influencer or whatever might happen to be you know, my I think, kids. So I'm gonna interject yeah. real quick. So, like, okay, so Hayden's a senior, in in kindergarten, they ask them when they do their little kindergarten graduation and they get their little diploma, they shake hands with their, you know, principal and the teacher. They ask them what they want to be when they grow up, and they they read this at my children's school. They read this, and so, but to listen to 13 years ago when Hayden walked across the little gym floor and shook his little teacher's hand and all the kids what they wanted to be to be TikTok famous or to be an influencer or to be a YouTuber that was non-existent all right as Stella walked across that same little gym last year mm. I I don't remember how many there were but quite a few I'm gonna grow up I'm gonna be a YouTuber really five years old six years old Really? Kind of sad. Kind of scary. Um, Isn't that crazy? So well, I'm just sorry. I, had, I don't yeah, think I've ever no, shared no, that story with you. So I don't think you have that, either. But, right, but well, it's fascinating. It's, right. Because, because the disciples do. are doing the same thing. What, what do you mean, Jesus? It's the rich people that are in God's kingdom. Clear, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, no. And he says, no, it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they were greatly astounded and said to one another, then, then who can be saved? Uh, I think for them it was a legitimate question because they had been taught their entire lives that the successful people are the embodiment of faithfulness. Right. And, and this in no way says that being successful is a mark of unfaithfulness right but what it says in this context is it's impossible for us to enter the kingdom of heaven on our own right something must change in us Jesus must do something for us he says and he says that in verse 27 
Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but for God, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. And so again, the, the fact that there are poor people in heaven is because of the work of Jesus. Right. The fact that there will be rich people in heaven is because of the work of Jesus. Right. But ultimately, all of us need the work of Jesus. It's right. not, uh, yeah, it's not anything that we can do on our own. Uh, but this next little section there, you know, Peter then starts really thinking about it. And in, and in some ways, Peter's going, oh, well, good. Well, right. we've look at what we've done. Look at what we've done. You know, we've we've we have sold everything. We have Jesus. We've left everything behind. They Wait. got out of the boat. You they know, left family. All, they all left jobs. Stuff. They walked away. Right. The, you know, Jesus called and they followed. And so it's uh, yeah. And Jesus is like, yep, yep, that's that's right because this is what's going to happen. But there's this great little line in there in verse thirty. Um, Those who have left everything. Uh, everybody basically will receive a hundredfold now and in this age uh, houses brothers and sisters mothers and children and fields with persecution and so even with that right it's like oh, oh wait living. there's wait there's more, there's more. <laughs> uh, and and then in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last will be first so so Jesus is in both circumstances with the rich man. It says he loved him and he said, there's one more thing, you know, sell everything. Mm -hmm. But the disciples, oh, he loves them and they will get all this stuff and persecutions. And I think that's a part that we frequently skip over, that following Jesus is going to cost everything. Right. But yeah. then you will get everything. everything. And so, you know, Paul, when he was sharing the good news with the Gentiles, you know, Paul gave everything. Yeah. And and all throughout Acts, on this last final journey as he's going to Jerusalem, he's, he's interacting with all these different people that he shared the gospel with, and they're, they're showering him with blessings, and they're praising his name, and it's just, you know, he, he has the family of God. Right. He has the blessings of... Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and mothers and children in fields. But Paul also knows that he is going to ultimately be martyred for his faith. Right. Paul has experienced all of these persecutions and he'll continue to experience the persecutions up until the point where he's actually even killed. Right. And and I don't know, you know, us modern American Christians, we skip over that line quite it's, regularly. Right. Those are difficult things yep. um, for us in a society who values comfort and ease and um, yeah, that's not in a void, right? We just avoid the things we don't like. I like Christmas Jesus. I like Easter Jesus. I don't like Good Friday Jesus. Right. Those are hard. Well, with humans, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Through Christ, all things are possible. Praise the Lord. Okay. Um, okay. Got anything else? I think, <laughs> I think that's it. I don't know. Okay. How about I close this? That sounds great. All right. Gracious and loving Father. Thank you for your words to us today, even when they're difficult words. Um, we know that you love us, and I just pray that that we love you, and that we love you well, and that it, it will cost us to follow you and to be transformed. And I pray that we that we come to you, and that we we look. To you even when it's difficult and we lean in in Jesus name I pray amen amen well thanks for joining us this week we look forward to the next time together if you do have any questions or comments or concerns don't uh, don't hesitate to go ahead and call the church and see if you can get a hold of one of us or others that would be very interested in listening and 
uh, sharing and praying with you. That'd be great. But uh, until that time, look forward to uh, the next time we get to be together. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.